Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be joined today by the director of the new film, Bandit, Canadian director, Alan Unger. Alan, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad at all. Thanks. Appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me today. Of course. Um, of course, we're talking about your new film, Bandit. But before we get into that, because there are so many emerging directors and filmmakers who, who, who watch this, I'm very curious, how did you get your start in directing? You know, it's funny. I, I can't go back in time and remember a point in my life where I didn't want to make movies. Um, you know, I used to skip school as a kid all the time to watch, you know, all kinds of films, Bond stuff with my dad and you know, I was a big fan of, you know, like even John Woo and Michael Bay when I was like in elementary school. And so I've always been a nut for it. And so uh, when I was in high school, I was very, very fortunate that I was able to convince my parents to send me to film school during the summer. So I'd essentially do my high school exams. I would go to L.A., and go to the New York Film Academy, which I know sounds bizarre because it's New York Film Academy in Los Angeles. But I think they even have one on a, cru a cruise ship. So. <laughs> Um, I was doing that for about three summers and then I went to York University in Toronto and they rejected me from the film program and they put me into film uh, history. And so I thought it was really bizarre. So instead of going to class, I ended up just writing specs and shadowing producers, interning, knocking on doors wherever I could. And then I went to Los Angeles on a whim uh, to the American film market just to see what it was about. I was about 18 years old. And um, I met these guys who happened to be from Canada as well. And they were looking to start a film fund. And that's pretty much how I got my first break. It was at a house party um, with the cast of the, uh, the HBO miniseries, The Pacific. It was just very random. I met these guys and um, they started helping me finance films. It was, it was awesome. That's amazing. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you've chosen this, this career path because we've got a lot of great films of yours to enjoy now. Um, specific about this film, Bandit, would you, would you mind telling the good people what Bandit is about? Yeah, Bandit is based on the true story of the Flying Bandit, who was a gentleman who escaped from prison um, in the 80s and crossed the border into Canada. And he essentially met a woman, he fell in love with her, he wanted to go straight and narrow, uh, but he just couldn't find a way to provide the way he wanted to. And so he started robbing banks and discovered he was exceptionally good at it. And so over the course of two years, there was this sort of manhunt for him, because uh, nobody knew who he was, he would essentially... Um, fly himself first class around Canada after discovering the uh, aeroplan program on Air Canada. And he would basically go, he was living in Ottawa, and he would fly to Vancouver or to Edmonton or to Halifax or to Toronto. And he'd rob a couple banks in a day, go home for dinner. Nobody was any wiser. And they had this task force essentially chasing him for two years until they finally caught up to him in uh, 1988. And he still has the record for the most uh, consecutive bank robberies in Canadian history. Madness. Let's hope that's a record that just stands and nobody. Yeah, let's this. leave it at that. <laughs> let's just leave it at that. Yeah. So, um, of course, uh, in, in, in addition to, you know, uh, uh, a wonderful film, there's different elements that, that you need. Obviously, great direction, great writing. But we also have got a really good cast here. You've got Josh Duhamel in the, in, the, in the lead role. You've got Alicia Cuthbert, Mel Gibson, Nestor Carvanel. Can you take a moment and talk about how the process of casting went about? Yeah. Kind of put um, together like an all star team here. No, and thank you. I really appreciate that. They're all uh, incredible in the film. And so, you know, we went out with the project um, right at the beginning of COVID, like before COVID happened. And so we were trying to find our Robert Whiteman, our Gilbert Galvin, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Josh read the script very early on. And I think a week later, um, I got a call that he wanted to get on the phone. And he was so taken by the story. And, you know, he felt like this could be his catch me if you can. Um, and that's kind of how his manager pitched it to him. So Josh was on board pretty much right at the beginning. And then the world went to hell. Um, and we were trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to do this, how long we needed to wait. Can we shoot in Canada? Can we not shoot in Canada? And so unbeknownst to me at the time, um, Josh's manager is also Alicia's manager. Oh, okay. And Alicia was always my first choice for the role. She was always my first choice. I wanted a Canadian. I was a huge fan of hers growing up. And uh, because of the situation with the pandemic, we just we kind of put things on hold for a little bit. So we never formally went out to her, but the manager slipped her the script. And so I didn't know she'd already read it and she really wanted to do it. And so she was waiting until the moment was right that we were kind of emerge again, essentially, and say, OK, now we we know how and when we're going to make this film. So she uh, you know, when I got a call from the 647 area code, I was like, oh, my God, is this my fellow Canadian? And, and we hit it off right away. So that was amazing. <laughs> That's and fantastic. then, and then basically once we had the two of them, we were trying to find our Tommy K 
And Mel has this uncanny resemblance to the real Tommy K, whose name was Tommy Craig. He was a notorious gangster and loan shark and sort of like top grade fencer in Vanier in Ottawa uh, in the 80s. And so I was like, it's got to be Mel. And so we took a swing at Mel. He said, yes, he really um, was fond of the fact that it was you know, based on a true story. Uh, we talked, we hit it off. And that was that. And then right before we started shooting, I'd say about two weeks before we started shooting, Nestor came on board. Uh, Nestor was at the same agency as Mel, which is where I used to be as well. So Nestor was at a Comic-Con convention or something in Sarasota. He got the offer. He called me the next day and he was on a plane to Georgia. So it, it, yeah, it kind of came together in one of those ways where it just sort of fit perfectly. It, seem, it, seems, it just seems very organic. And I, I do want to mention, this is a film that is set in Canada, but due to COVID restrictions, if I'm not mistaken, you did have to shift uh, filming locations. It's a bizarre story. I'm pretty sure Mel, I think Mel and the whole cast, you know, we kind of joke that we are probably the first film in history to be set in Canada, but shot outside. Of <laughs> like, it's just not something that happens. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the pandemic made things really complicated because if you're someone like Mel and you're working for a week and you got to sit for two weeks quarantining in a hotel room, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so that was a, that was a huge obstacle for us, but to be quite candid, it was also because we didn't receive any support from the, the sort of uh, Canadian agencies and subsidies, tax credits. We were very fortunate to be helped early on in the development process by the Harold Greenberg fund, which helps you with the script development, okay. but, um, nobody else cared. Nobody wanted to support the film. There was no cast attached. It was just us trying to get this Canadian movie pulled. Telefilm had no interest. Uh, nobody else really was looking to rally for us. And so because the movie had to be made at a certain price point, the tax credits here weren't strong enough. We couldn't get the film made. So I was basically, I got on the phone one day and the producer said to me, hey, listen, this is going to sound bizarre, but we're not going to Vancouver. We're not going to Ottawa. We're not going to Toronto. We're going to Georgia. And you have to double Atlanta for Vancouver and rural Georgia for the suburbs in Ontario. Can you make it work? And I said, I'll sure as hell try. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot of attention to detail right down to like the currency back in those back in yeah. uh, those times. So so again, congratulations. Well done uh, on, on the film. Um, what is it about the story that, that that inspired you? You know, when I got the script from my agent, I didn't know um, about guilt. Like I'd heard the moniker, the flying bandit, uh, mm -hmm. but I didn't know much about the story. And so I got the book that Robert Knuckle and Ed Arnold wrote in the 90s. Okay. And I read through it and I was like, oh my God, it's it's one of those stranger than fiction moments. It's I just thought that this guy was so charismatic. He had his eyes set on this goal, despite how ludicrous it was. And he actually meant well. I mean, he never hurt anybody. He never fired a shot. His guns were always empty. He had a flair for the theatrics. Um, I just thought, you know, how has nobody told this story before? He's got a record. And it's Canadian. I think one of the biggest things, to be quite honest with you, was I've always wanted to, I say, I always want to flip cars in my backyard. You know, people come to Canada, they come to Toronto, and it doubles for New York or it doubles for another American city. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that, you know, Canada plays as Canada. And so that was a huge thing for me. Of course, you know, leaving Canada to shoot it somewhere else ended up being, you know, a bit of a smack. But yeah. um, I was really drawn to the sort of human elements. Um, the narrative, I thought, again, was incredible. And the, the Canadian sort of uh, component was really important to me. Okay, excellent. Um, and I also love that this this film is some and somewhat a love letter to the 80s as well. Yeah. Because I mean, there's, I mean, I can't recall the last time, you know, Karma Chameleon by Culture Club featured so prominently in the film. Yeah. There's, there's other like, you know, different different little anecdotes uh, spliced in there as well. Now, the, the, the Culture Club reference, is that something that you particularly wanted or was that just? Yeah, so this is a fun story. Um, so when we, we revised the script when Mel had signed on. We, you know, the Tommy character was always meant to be, okay, oh, are, is he going to be the tough guy gangster that Robert's going to get in trouble with? Like, like, we wanted to subvert that trope, mm -hmm. right, which, which, you, which you saw. Um, so starting him off kind of like this facade, this tough guy, we thought there was something to be said about the fact that, you know, I'm 33, but I feel like an old person. So when I hear new music, I'm like, oh, I miss the 90s. Oh, I miss the 80s, like the old guard, right? Yeah, yeah. So we thought, you know, this guy would be totally a Sinatra fan, a Dean Martin fan, like the old guard. And now you've got this new wave of music with the makeup and the highlights and the crazy music videos. And so we put in um, that exact reference. It was always Boy George. And because there's the whole 
idea of identity and duality and sort of the way that Boy George represented, we thought it was a perfect tie-in. But the problem is when we shot the movie, for whatever reason, nobody from production cleared it. We, oh. we didn't have the rights to the cassette tape. We didn't have the rights to uh, Josh whistling. We found it in post that we were kind of screwed. So Craig Wenman, the writer, and I wrote a letter to Boy George. And we basically told him how important it was, you know, to be a part of this. And yeah, and then and it kind of all worked out perfectly. He'd That's even amazing. offered to um, write a song for the end credits, but we just, we didn't have the time. We didn't have the money and it, it uh -huh. didn't work out sadly. But yeah, that was a fun one. That's amazing. Yeah, because I mean, chameleon, we've got a bank robber, kind of a chameleon. I like it. I like yeah. it. Um, and, and one of the things that I, that I absolutely love about, about your story is that you, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, you're, you're already working on your next project tenfold. Oh, um, is that on my IMDb? Yeah. That is not a project I'm working on currently. Oh, okay. But, IMDb, no, no, okay. you lied to me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I just finished um, producing a film in Vegas with Nicolas Cage and Joel Kinnaman, which is getting announced at TIFF next week called uh, Sympathy for the Devil. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I have a couple of projects I'm working on right now as a director. One is a one is a prison film called Solitary, and the other is uh, an action comedy called London Calling. So okay. very much in my wheelhouse. All right. The point that I was driving at is that you're consistently working, and I think that's a wonderful thing. So we'll, trying to, I'm trying yeah, to. yeah. So I, I listen before we wrap up. We're going to do some rapid fire questions, but again, the name of the movie is Bandit. I wish you all the success with it. I think it's a very entertaining film, and again, I love the fact that you've got Canada as a, as a backdrop, regardless of where it was filmed. Very entertaining performances. You've put together a great cast, and I think people are really going to enjoy this film. Thank you. All right, so the rules of rapid fire, Alan Unger, are pretty simple. I'm going to ask you a question. This is meant to be nothing but fun. Just oh, no. think, just give me the first thing that comes to your mind. The first question of rapid fire, as you know, being being a big fan, as I'm sure you are, is always, Alan, what is your favorite movie of all time? And because it's such a challenging question, even if you want to give me a top three, I'll accept it. The Rock is my favorite movie of all time. Excellent. Excellent. There's no wrong answers in rapid fire, by the way. All right. Uh, several years ago, you did a movie called Tapped Out where there was a there was an MMA theme and you had a lot of uh, uh, mixed martial arts um, uh, participants, uh, fighters, if you will, in, in that film. So putting that cap on uh, uh, in, in, in his prime, George St. Pierre against an in his prime, Anderson Silva, who are you taking in that? Oh, don't make me answer that. Um, uh, Silva. OK. All right. Uh, next question for you. What was it like directing an Academy Award winning director? Um, incredibly intimidating uh, <laughs> first, but uh, as soon as we started working together, he pretty much trusted me right away and he, can, he stayed out of my way and just said, yes, sir. No, sir. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Fair. What is a song from the eighties that would make your playlist today? Um... Oh, man. I mean, Karma Chameleon, because it's in the movie. <laughs> all right. Fair. Fair. <laughs> it's a weak answer. I know. Fair. No, no. It's, it's all good. It's all it's all love here in Rapid Fire. Does Nestor Carbonell wear eyeliner? <laughs> I feel like I can't tell you that because not. No, he okay. doesn't. And, and just so you know, you can't see, but my eye, like him and I standing next to one another became the butt of a lot of jokes because, you know, my eyelashes are so long and his are long, but because he has the dark sort of shade underneath, um, he gets called out on it, but no, but you know what, if you want to find out, go watch Bandit September 23rd and you'll get your answer. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, um, rank these in order of your favorite to do. Like, I don't think there's anything about this list that you're probably not going to like doing, but writing, directing, producing, because you've done them all. So which, which is, which are you most passionate uh, about? Directing's think? first. Writing a second, producing a third. Thank you. And who would you love to collaborate with that you haven't as of yet? Uh, actors? Anybody. Um, I'm leaving it open for you. If you want to give me a cinematographer, I'll take it. I'd love to work with a fellow Canadian, Ryan Reynolds. That love would be that. great. Well, he would be very lucky to, to get to work with you. So there you go. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and lastly, last question. Um, going back to we're talking about, you know, emerging talent. What's the advice that you, that you, you give to uh, emerging filmmakers? I always say to everybody when I get asked this question that now that there's accessibility in a way we never had before with technology, go out and shoot films, short films, experiment, make mistakes, screw up um, and learn. Because at the end of the day, I learned this as, as a lot of my colleagues have as well. Nobody's just going to reach out and, and, and give you a shot unless, you know, it's like a one in a million lottery. You really need to hustle. You need to work. It's got to be the thing on your mind when you wake up and go to bed. 
every single day um, and just keep trying, keep failing and, and keep working on it. That's it. I love that. His name is Alan Unger. The name of the film is Bandit. It is coming out soon. Make sure you check it out. Alan, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, man.